Howdy folks and welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory and I will be your host and I am joined by my co-host Mark S. Mann. On today's show we start out discussing um, President Putin of Russia and the possibility of Russia cutting off the export of Russian ammunition to the United States. We're going to look at the 762 by 39 in particular. We're also going to discuss the presidential cycles over the course of the past 10 to 15 years and the impact that that's had on firearm and ammunition sales. We're also going to discuss quality versus quantity ammunition. We're going to touch on a couple of other subjects as well. We're going to join the conversation already in progress, so thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe, comment, and share. Thank you so much. Here we go. So what, what were you saying about Putin and the Russian imports of ammunition? Well, it, there, there was nothing like, you know, people, there was a rumor uh, that basically came out that said, you know, as a uh, response to sanctions that were uh, placed on Russia, that one of the things that Putin was going to do was suspend the shipments of ammunition yes. into the United States. And there's nowhere anywhere that I can see that that's happened officially. What, what has happened as, is that people in the industry, retailers, consumers, dealers, they have all used the threat of that to clean the shelves of what is out there, to strip the shelves of what is out there. Oh, so, okay. You know, a lot of the uh, importers like Wolf, Tula, FMK, those guys have nothing. They have nothing left. They've been, they're sold out. So, um, you know, how long that will last is, you know, not really on the table right now. I mean, I'm sure that when these things happen, you have at least a 60 to 90 day dry spell uh, once that happens. So, you know, if, if things kind of dock down over the summer, which it looks like they're going to be, right now and and a lot of people thought a shooting would start over this stuff i never thought that i mean i even i even wrote about that if we're gonna get into world war three with the russians it's not going to be over ukraine or crimea but uh you know the it looks like the economic sanctions have uh, the economic war is definitely turned up you know what i mean it's yes. it's, it's and when you look at you know, all the stuff that's happening in the energy markets as far as what these people are considering uh, taking payment for, what other, you know, countries are taking payment for, that certainly could could get hot uh, pretty quick. So, um, you know, it, it just shows, I think what this shows is how quickly uh, things can change and how, how little inventory there really is uh, on the market. Well, and from a purely speculative perspective, I mean, it could be Russia has, in fact, told their North American distribution points coming out of Russia to slow walk those orders, not ship for two weeks or three weeks. And yeah, or I would imagine it's more like months, to be honest with you. But you know, it's 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 kind of really hard to say because those agents. Are pretty much their 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 distributors here in the United States are usually wholly owned subsidiaries of the manufacturers overseas. So you know if you're dealing with somebody from you know the USA branch, usually those are people that have been put here by the manufacturer overseas. It's hard to really say what what's going on because those people work for the Russian companies. They don't work for an American company. So their loyalties lie uh, to the foreign governments that uh, the countries in the host countries where they're located. I think at this point, it's safe to say that prices are going to go up on that stuff. The thing is, Rory, when you look at the ammunition market, what a lot of people don't understand about it is that no matter what happens, imported ammunition is really what keeps a lot of people shooting because people can't afford 
Like when you look at stuff that you and I were talking about in the past, about stuff like 762 by 39, there's a huge price difference there. Yes, so, there is. You know, if you can't if you can't afford a dollar a round, which most people can't, and sometimes it's not even a matter of affording it. It's like, hey, why do I want to, you know, if something was uh, 40, 50 cents last year, why do I want to pay a dollar a round, whether you can afford it or not? You know, a lot of people feel like they're getting ripped off, myself included. Yes. And I'm not going to shoot it anyway, just out of principle. So, you know, it's it's... I think that you and I have talked about this before, and the, the thing that I think is really difficult uh, that people don't understand is that the, the powers that be, they didn't really figure it out that the best way to, to affect uh, and, and limit people's ability to shoot and train and all that stuff is not by messing with their ability to, to own guns, but really messing with the availability of ammunition and affecting the price, something that a lot of people know for sure now because they've lived through it several times. If you're somebody that's a shooter and you're involved in, in uh, you know, shooting sports and uh, you're, 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 you have firearms as an interest, uh, if you've been doing this for a while, you've been through a couple of the cycles over the last few years, the election cycles, uh, the different legislative cycles which have influenced the stuff. It's gotten to the point where uh, it's not cheap anymore. It's really right. gotten to be uh, really cost prohibitive for a lot of people to get into the sport. As far as the legislation that, and these different cycles that you're referring to, it seems that the, what's been happening over the past, say, 10 years, that those cycles are far more pronounced and a lot closer together. So you have a much deeper and broader uh, effect on on the ammunition supplies and those events are seemingly getting closer. Would you agree with that or not? Oh, absolutely. What's compounded it even more is the trend of, of new shooters coming into the demographic is even more where, you know, when you go back into the 90s around the original crime bill, 1994, uh, when a lot of the import bans took effect, uh, firearms ownership was not, you know, in the Clinton years, it was in decline. Where now, where we are today, it's going the complete opposite other way. Where, you know, back then, you had less people uh, owning firearms and, and, and less new shooters involved in the sport. Where today, you know, you have a lot of new people coming into the demographic. Yes. And what's significant about that is, you know, it's, it's <laughs> what it is, is it means that there's less products for more people, you know. And, and that's, that's significant because a lot of these companies, yes, they've ramped up their production over the years. But, you know, the demand is still really strong. So it's like there's a big difference there in terms of what people were demanding in the early 90s compared to what the demand is 20 years later after you have all kinds of millions more shooters coming into the demographic. Millions and that's really what's happened. I mean, you have millions of people that have become gun owners in the last seven to eight years, within, even within the last two election cycles where, you know, a lot of people who were not interested in uh, becoming a gun owner uh, because they were interested in sport shooting or target shooting or competition shooting or hunting or anything recreational. They're simply getting into it for the fact that millions of people have woken up and said, hey, we're screwed here. Uh, yes. There's going to be an economic meltdown. And whether I like guns or not, I better wake up to the fact that one day... Breaking up. I need to be able to protect my family and the people I care about. So I better get my son to be able to do that. And yes. that's made a difference in, in demand. Well, yeah, and it's made, it's made a huge difference because, I mean, if you just look at, if you just sell one box of practice round and one box of home defense round or self-defense round, that in itself, 
I mean, there's there's a couple of million boxes right there. I don't think that people really understand the market is a lot more sensitive, you know, they, they, than they give it credit for. Like, for example, what you just said makes a lot of sense. If you have one person go out and buy one box of ammo multiplied by however many new people are in the demographic, not including the people who have been hunting and shooting and, you know, been part of the sport for years like you and I have been, just the new people alone add up to a tremendous amount of variation in the demand for those products. Exactly. So when you look at that uh, on a production basis, that's a lot more than what manufacturers are able to ramp up with. In other words, you know, a lot of these manufacturers, they can't do more than a 15 to 20 percent change in, in uh, increased production. That may even be a lot for some of them because, you know, the bottom line is you can only run three shifts a day and then, uh, you know, you come down to the point where you have raw materials issues on top of that. So, yes. you know, for copper, brass, zinc, lead, primers, powder, projectiles, all those things, a lot of times, even the big boys are not making 100% of those components in their factories. And what a lot of people don't understand is that when you look at the manu uh, ammunition manufacturers, they are the stuff that they're using today, the components, the materials, all of those things that they use today have been probably sourced and forecasted many months before those materials were actually used in production. Exactly. I mean, and, 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 and that's an excellent point that you just made, Mark, because if you just look at it, ammunitions or the manufacturer of, of the gun itself or the weapon itself, if you just look at it from a purely production standpoint, you can look at any company and 90% and, and or more of all companies are making these types of projections that you were talking about. And they can't see, you know, I made, I'm making my projection, you know, in April of 2014 and, I, and I've got to see all the way out to 2015. I don't see that something's going to happen in September. You right. Know? No one could have predicted Sandy Hook would have happened and then exactly. changed the, the the game for what demand would be for the next sixteen months. You know, no exactly. I mean it's not it's not possible to do not that. Possible. And you know, the, the other thing, Rory, that I want to mention when it comes to all this stuff that we're talking about production, and this is not a dig on the firearms industry, but people need to think about this. Anytime you're going balls to the wall like that with production and increasing your numbers and doing all that kind of stuff. Quality turns to shit. People's quality control goes way down when that stuff happens. You know, there's there's a lot of companies whose product that I would not have wanted to purchase within the last year to a year and a half because when that stuff happens, things don't have to be right. They just have to be sold and stuff gets put in a box and shipped out the door that should have never happened. It's all because they're so busy, they're so crazy, they're so intent on meeting goals and deadlines and quotas and all kinds of stuff. And you know, people say, "Hey, you know, I I want to buy this or I want to buy that." And my my response is, "Well, if no one's really forcing you to do it now, uh, my advice is to wait until you know this is over and until things get kind of back to." Uh, a better level of quality. You know, I've seen a lot of garbage that's gone out the door from manufacturers over the last year and a half because of all the things that I'm saying. And once again, you, you're making an excellent point as far as the quality. Even though we all want to live in the dream world of 100% accuracy, that's not realistic. And, I, yeah. and, my, and my guess is, and I don't know, and you may be able to speak to this, but my guess is that is that they have an accuracy uh, quote or a quota that they have to meet of, you know, like 99.3 or 99.7. I mean, and do I really want to have, do I want to fall into that 0.7 or 0.3 category with any single round? Because it could be that one round that is the one that 
makes the difference between literally life and death. When you look at the firearms industry, depending on, on when you're ma- ma- making something, when you're manufacturing something, there's usually kind of like a de facto industry standard, which is considered to be, hey, if you're getting returns of above X percent, then there's a problem. You know, I mean, I think even in the best times when companies have really stringent quality control guidelines in place, you know, there's when you're manufacturing something, there's always going to be a bad apple. And yes. that's not due to people's sloppiness or laziness or lack of care or when you're manufacturing stuff, uh, especially stuff with moving parts and complex uh, uh, items, you know, you have problems with materials, uh, engineering problems that don't manifest themselves right away. When you look at that stuff um, in the firearms industry, generally a good accepted number across the board is 2% or less. This is what people need to understand, and this is where it gets kind of crazy, okay? Over the last couple of years, ammunition prices have gone up so much, the amount of people that have been buying guns versus shooting guns has really become kind of off balance, meaning you have a lot of people that have bought guns over the last year, and these guns have not been shot. They've been purchased, put in a safe, or put in a closet, because and you know people are saying, well, hey, I'm buying this because I may not be able to buy it in the future, or I'm buying this because I think it may be worth more in the future, or I'm buying it because I, I want it, but I can't afford to really shoot it now because the prices of ammunition are so high. What happens because of that is you get a inaccurate number about the amount of guns that are uh, in that 2% range. Because if people are buying product and not shooting it, how do you know if the gun's got an issue or not? You don't. Right? You, you so don't. It's an unknown. Yeah, it's, it's an unknown. So people people don't, you know, manufacturers are sitting there saying, oh, this is, this is our current return rate. Uh, or this is our current, you know, um, problem rate with a part or a gun or a product or whatever. But I don't think uh, for the last few years that that's been accurate because a lot of people are buying guns, but a lot of people are not shooting guns right now. And that's all because of ammunition prices. So to get to get a true sense of where that is, I think, um, you know, we'd have to see ammunition prices come down. Uh, another 15 to 20 percent minimally before people start consuming what they used to consume and people start shooting up uh, what they what they're shooting up you know on the uh, rifle side of things 5.56 millimeter 223 which is probably one of the most common rifle calibers if not the most common most high demand rifle caliber in the United States uh, is still hovering at around 50 cents a round for the good stuff, 50 cents plus uh, with tax in a lot of places. If you're buying it online and you see you can get less than that, then you still have to factor the shipping cost in, which shipping costs are going up all the time. So in my opinion, in, until prices get back down to around 35%, which were they, which is where they used to be for a long time, uh, you know, I think you're going to see the market stay a a little soft unless something happens and we start seeing a new push for legislative action. 2% is kind of like a guideline for the industry. If you're at or below 2%, it's considered to be acceptable in terms of a manufacturing standard. Well, let's look look at that for just, I want to look at that for just a quick second and and put that that into some kind of context because... If you've got a, a 2% failure rate, and that's, an, and that's the industry standard, and, I, and my guess is, and I, I don't know this to be true, you may have some insight on it, but I, as XYZ Ammunition Manufacturing <laughs> Company, I'm going to set my bar a lot higher than that, and I'm going to say that we only have a half percent fail rate. So there's a 1.5% discrepancy between the standard and what I'm actually doing. So if you look at that one and a half percent standard and what you were what you were talking about, Mark, as far as the sheer volume, the manufacturers and the pressure to meet the demand and the quality is going to change, 
and all, and you know, and me as X Y Z ammunition manufacturing, you know, yes, under normal circumstances, my my fail rate is 0.5. My standard is two. I'm going to throw out that that one and a half percent, and I'm going to go with the 98 percent. And now all of a sudden, instead of one piece, now I'm looking at three per thousand yeah, or I mean, more. You know, and, 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 that, and that in itself is, has the potential to create issues that are currently unseen simply because they're buying new firearms, but they're not using them. They're not practicing. They're not, they're not getting rid of them and replacing them to, to expose what's actually hidden. They're, they're hoarding is exactly. what they're doing. They're hoarding. Exactly. Right? Basically, Rory, when you look at the recalls on, on lots of ammunition are fairly common. I mean, it doesn't happen every day, but you know, you usually see at least one to two a month where a manufacturer is saying, hey, if you have XYZ brand of ammunition, uh, you know, look on the box because if it's falls within lot number to lot number, they're asking you to send it back for an exchange. Manufacturing in the firearm, you know, gun blows up. It's it's usually not the gun. It's usually the ammunition. Getting back to the return rate, you know, two percent is two uh, percent return rate is usually uh, an, a, a solid industry standard for quality control. So if you have less than two percent return rates you're considered to be doing pretty good. Uh, over 2%, that's when the magnifying glass starts to really get put on certain operations within the manufacturing process to see what's going on there. Recalls in the firearms industry are, are, are fairly common. The question is whether people know about them or not. As long as their product is working, they're really not paying attention. Uh, you know, look at, uh, not like I said, not to harp on the firearms industry, there's a lot of incestuous behavior going on because a lot of people don't realize manufacturers make parts for each other, even for competing manufacturers. That's something that not a lot of people understand and realize where, you know, you'll have people sit here and say, well, my XYZ brand AR-15 is better than yours, and both of those companies that you're comparing them to use the same bolt carriers and the same lower receivers and the same barrels, and people look at you and say, no, I, I didn't know that. And, it, you know, uh, it's true. I want to just make one final point on this, and that, and that is that, thank goodness, <laughs> that there aren't any recalls that we are aware of on ammunition or firearms, that there aren't any of these negative things that could happen if this manufacturing quality standard deviated from anything less than perfect. And the reason I say that is because if it were in this current atmosphere, it would be so in your face, the gun grabbers would have an absolute field day if there were an issue uh, a, of a recall kind of a situation, that it would be magnified by 10, at least. They understand that they have a liability issue there. Yes. This is different. People could be maimed, hurt, or killed yes. as a result. I would think that it would only take one incident, you know, for XYZ ammo manufacturer to go out of business because people are going to immediately get rid of all the product that they may have and they certainly aren't going to buy any new. I mean, no, and, and you're right. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of smaller ammunition companies that have sprung up over the last couple of years and I'm not knocking anybody's product, but what what I would tell people is listen, if you and, and I want to make a, a point here that 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 I want to make sure people understand, right? If you have gone out and spent your hard-earned money on a product, uh, a nice handgun or a nice rifle, and you've spent $1,000 for an AR-15 rifle, don't be cheap and shoot the lowest quality ammunition that you possibly can through the gun for, for a couple different reasons. One, the three or four or five or six... <laughs> Save on a round of ammunition, uh, you know, let's call it 50 bucks for a thousand round case, is not worth 
the potential damage that you could do to your thousand dollar gun. Because at the end of the day, if you had some garbage ammunition blow up a thousand dollar rifle, and if you were lucky enough to escape that without losing a finger or an eye or, you know, have whatever physical damage that you had to yourself, at the end of the day, I guarantee you, if I said, here's 70 bucks or uh, your rifle back, you take your rifle every time. So, you know, you have to, you have to look at that and say to yourself, you know, it's not just a question of whether it's cheaper or not, you know, and people will say, oh, well, that's BS and this ammo doesn't hurt that and this. And I say, okay, well, if you had a Ferrari, would you run 87 octane through the gun? I mean, through the car all the time. And no. people say, no, I wouldn't do that. It would ruin the engine. Well, then why do you think that wouldn't hurt your rifle if you did it? You know, shooting a thousand rounds of steel case ammo through your gun, uh, if you have an AR-15, if you're, you're shooting Russian ammo through the gun, it's probably not going to hurt the gun. But if you do thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds of that through your gun and that's all you shoot, eventually you're going to wear parts out. You can do things to, to the gun which have a negative effect. And there's going to be people say that that's not true. And I'm going to tell you, it may not have happened in your gun, but I've seen it happen over rifles, dozens and dozen rifles over several years in the industry. You know, it's it's just like anything else. You are what you eat. And if you feed your, your weapon garbage ammo, you're going to have a problem down the road. And for some people that have the technical skill and the acumen to be able to deal with those issues, it may not be a big deal. Where I have some people say, hey, you know, if this uh, steel case ammunition wears out the extractor on my gun and I'm saving a hundred bucks a case by shooting that, I got no problem with that because I'll go out and buy an extractor for two or three bucks and I'll change it every four or five thousand rounds. And that's how I'm going to save money. And if you can do that and you're smart enough to do that and you have the skills and the tools and the equipment and the knowledge to do that, that's great. But people, when it comes to ammunition, need to understand all ammunition is not created equal. And it's it's a lot of times it's garbage in versus garbage out. Your, uh, your choice of ammunition will not only have a distinct performance advantage in what you're shooting in, in the accuracy and the muzzle velocity and all that stuff in the rifle, but it will also determine the life of your firearm. If you feed a car better gasoline, it's a proven fact that the car's engine will last longer. Is it worth the extra money to some people? Maybe not. But people need to be aware that that's the issue. There's a lot of people out there that think that, you know, Russian steel case ammunition is the same as shooting brass case ammunition. And that's not that's not true. OK, so people just need to be aware of that. But we can talk about that in more detail at some other point in time. I know that we're, um, you know, kind of going in a bunch of different directions today. But, you know, I just wanted to say that for the record. Thank you for all the knowledge and all the time. We are, in fact, going to get into a couple of specific topics. And we're going to do that on the next call. And I appreciate everybody listening. This is the, the weekly metal update with uh, myself, Rory, Mark S. Mann, my trusted co-host. And we will speak with you again very soon. Don't forget to subscribe, comment, and share. Thank you so much.